I am very excited for this video guys, and I'll tell you why. You know when creationists are always trying to make scientific claims in an attempt to prove their idea of creation? They always try to challenge evolution and they're always telling us that the world was created 6,000 years ago. And one of the common responses from myself and also other atheist YouTube channels is to say, well if you're so confident about your interpretation of the scientific evidence, then you should just publish your own paper instead of ranting to people on the internet about this. And yes, that is true. If you firmly believe you've discovered something that science has yet to discover, you can write a paper and publish it. And if it flips an entire well-established scientific theory such as the theory of evolution, then you would be famous. Yet I haven't seen that being done at all, until now. That's why I'm excited, because we're going to watch this video that references a creationist paper. Then we're going to spend a little bit of time scrutinizing that paper. The reading may get a little dry, but don't worry, I'll do my best to translate the scientific jargon. Alright, let's begin. The global flood occurred about 4,500 years ago based on biblical chronologies. After the flood, the earth was repopulated by Noah's three sons and their wives. So we should find genetic signatures of this timeline in human DNA. Before we get to the meat of the video, I will have to say that this is basically impossible. 4,500 years is not enough time to explain a lot of things. For example, we have people of all different races. The genetic variety cannot be explained in a mere 4,500 years. In addition, a bottleneck of only a few people also means that there isn't enough genetic variety to keep the species alive. We're not even talking about people being selected at random. It's Noah, his sons, and their wives. That's like the lowest genetic variety you could possibly get. This means that incest is a huge problem. It also means that it's incredibly easy to wipe out the last few humans if something were to happen, such as a disease, because there isn't any genetic variety to ensure survival. Survival of the fittest does not work if there is no genetic variety. Rather, it would just be no survival. These are two key points that creationists have yet to address, but I've already talked about these more extensively in a previous video, so I won't let it distract us from the main part of the video today. While a number of previous studies by both secular and creation scientists have supported this general timeline, a recent study using extensive newly available high quality DNA sequence data for the human Y chromosome confirms the earlier research and solidifies the Bible's history of modern human origins. Ah yes, there it is. Look at it. It looks just like a legit scientific paper. Let's have a read, shall we? Okay, so right off the bat we see that it says answers in Genesis there. Well then, there might be some bias then, but let's not rule them out just yet. Another thing I noticed is that this paper isn't published anywhere except for their main website. Can't really say it has any authenticity if it's not published anywhere else. You may have written this in the scientific paper format, but that alone doesn't give it credit. <sighs> okay, let's read the abstract. Pedigree-based mutation rates act as an independent test of the young Earth creation and evolutionary timescales. Currently, evolutionists use published Y-chromosome pedigree-based mutation rates to argue for an ancient origin of humanity. However, their published studies rely on low-coverage sequence runs. We show that pedigree-based mutation rates from high-coverage sequence runs are hidden in the evolutionary literature, and we demonstrate that these rates confirm a 4,500-year history for human paternal ancestry. Okay, so let's go over the terminology a little bit here. You all know what pedigrees are. They're basically just the tree thing that you've all drawn in high school to study autosomal or sex-linked diseases. Pedigree-based mutation rates are essentially just mutation rates that were estimated from pedigree sequencing. You sequence a few people, such as parents and their offspring, and then when you compare them to each other and consider time and age of the samples, you can calculate their de novo mutation rates. I won't go into any more detail about this, just know that it's one of many ways to estimate mutation rates. Next, what are low coverage and high coverage sequence runs? I don't know why they wrote sequence runs instead of sequencing, I've never heard anyone write or say it like that before. I guess it's kind of what you expect from a creationist paper. Anyway, sequencing refers to the act of building up and determining the nucleotide composition of DNA, RNA, or proteins. If you hear the word sequencing by itself, it usually refers to nucleotides, and in this case, pedigree based mutation estimates must first come from the sequencing of the subject's genome. Now, there are so many different ways to sequence a person's DNA these days, and each method has their pros and cons. Depending on how you perform sequencing, you can get a variety of different types of reads. In order to understand what coverage means, I'll have to describe a little bit about how assembly works. Don't worry, I'll make it as simple and short as possible. In order for something to be sequenced, we need to use machinery that helps us detect and identify individual nucleotides. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are multiple ways to do this, but they are all limited by the capabilities of the machine. You can't sequence a few billions of nucleotides at once, it's just not possible. So instead, we first chop the DNA up to little tiny pieces, and then we sequence them. Now, we don't just chop one strand of DNA, we have multiple copies of the genome and we chop them all up and sequence them. After sequencing, we get a bunch of tiny DNA fragments, which we call reads. Finally, we use an algorithm in the computer and assemble it all together. And in most circumstances, we compare it to a reference genome for accuracy. The step is called assembly. Here's a visual on what it looks like. We have multiple fragments that overlap each other, and we use this overlapping to finally determine the overall sequence of the entire genome. The step here is done through computers and batch scripts, which conveniently for biologists have already been pre-written for us. Now, there can be multiple factors that affect the assembly accuracy. I won't go over all of them in detail, 
detail, but one of the more important ones is coverage. Coverage refers to the number of times a single nucleotide is read. If you look at the fragments here, this is 4x coverage because the nucleotide overlaps with four different reads. Coverage is important because sometimes it's difficult to determine if a nucleotide that differs from the reference genome is due to a single nucleotide polymorphism of the person's DNA we sequenced or if it's due to machine error. More coverage means we can ascertain that because reading it multiple times reduces machine error. Therefore, high coverage is better, low coverage is worse. Now, tying it back to the paper, the creationist author here is claiming that pedigree-based mutation estimates applied on Y-chromosome evolutionary clock analyses that supports an ancient origin of humanity is flawed due to low coverage sequencing. Then they claim that high coverage sequencing would support a 4,500 year ancestry instead. Okay, got all that? Good. I can't debunk anything right now because that's just the abstract, so we're gonna let the video play a little bit more and then we'll dive into the paper. When the chronologies and genealogies of the Bible are analyzed, humans were created about 6,000 years ago as one original ancestral couple, known as Adam and Eve. However, the human genome went through a genetic bottleneck about 4,500 years ago when only the DNA from Noah's three sons and their wives was used to repopulate the earth. This bottleneck must also be taken into account when analyzing DNA. These Bible-based dates conflict with the evolutionary speculation that claims that modern humans did not arise until about 100 to 200,000 years ago from ancestors migrating out of Africa. To help resolve the controversy, two scientists, one a molecular biologist and the other a statistician, downloaded newly available DNA sequence for the Y chromosome that was more comprehensive and covered much longer contiguous DNA regions that had not existed previously. Oh, huh. They didn't even conduct the studies themselves. Instead, they just went and used data that other scientists have gathered and interpreted it in their own way. Interesting. Well, I read through the entire paper, so you don't have to, and this seems to be true. They didn't gather data on their own and referenced a ton of other papers that were published previously. A great deal of it involves critiquing and trying to point out errors in the other paper's interpretations or sequencing. When reading through this, it didn't feel professional at all. It felt like it was someone who was writing this to complain about other studies. Anyway, let's address the point he mentioned. What is this quote, newly available DNA sequence that the authors used? Well, it seemed that there are two sources for this, obtained from other publications. One of which is Carmen et al., where they went into detail the filters they used for sequencing. The other is Moretti et al. For examples of low coverage sequencing, they only pulled out two other papers as well. If you want to read the details on their justifications on selection and modifications, feel free to read the paper yourself, but I won't be going over small details. The Y chromosome is particularly useful in studying human pedigrees and mutations because it has no chromosomal counterpart in the human genome with which to exchange genetic information in a process called recombination. Yes, and we also have mitochondrial DNA for females. When sperm and egg cells are formed in a person, the 22 chromosome pairs, one derived from the father and the one from the mother, will exchange DNA segments with each other. Because this does not occur with the Y chromosome, it is more genetically stable and thus very useful in genetic clock studies. In this current study, the authors know that if humans have actually been around for several hundred thousand years or more, they should have accumulated 8 to 59 times the amount of mutations that we currently observe in the Y chromosome DNA sequence. Okay, so we'll have a bit of a long explanation here, so I hope you'll bear with me. Anyway, I won't go over the nitty details of it all, but I'll try to present this in a bigger angle so it's easier to understand. The creationist's author stole some Y chromosome data from actual scientific papers. Two have high coverage sequencing and two have low coverage. They then applied their own bit of logic to it and came to the conclusion that the mutation rates from higher coverage sequencing was higher. Using that conclusion, they then further concluded that the common ancestor was about 4,500 years ago. How did they do this? Well, when you're sequencing something, it's very important to apply various modifications to it. Especially in the assembly process I mentioned earlier, there can be a lot of missing parts to read, so we need to form bridges, or perhaps a region has a lot of repeats which would make it difficult to form an accurate sequence. The list goes on, so we apply modifications to them. The first paper that was referenced, Carmen et al., applied a few filters to their data in order to improve data integrity, such as eliminating regions with low coverage. In Carmen's paper, there were justifications on why they used the filters they did, and this answers in Genesis' paper was quick to criticize it. Let's pull an example here. In the supplementary text, they explain that the rationale for explaining away the high rate was not a new discovery about the ambiguity of sequence read mapping. Rather, they stated that we initially applied a combination of regional filters previously defined on the basis of analyses of Illumina HiSeq data, resulting in 10 regions of chromosome Y sequence, altogether capturing 10.8 megabytes. However, the application of the regional filters led only to a modest reduction of false positive calls judged by the number of father-son-brother-brother differences and the count of recurrent mutations. Blah blah blah, then on the bottom. In other words, the carbon et al. test for false positives was an evolutionarily defined low mutation Rate. It's written there when they quoted Carmen that the purpose of the filters were to reduce false positives and variant calling. Variant calling is a process of identifying variations of sequences or individual nucleotides in comparison to a reference genome during assembly. False positives are bad because it would give you more single nucleotide.
five polymorphisms and copy number variations than there actually are, so eliminating them is crucial. In scientific literature, it's not dishonest, like what this creationist would have you believe, to check your premises with the results of other peer-reviewed literature. And that's exactly what Carmen did here. Science is about building upon what we already know in order to reach greater heights. Answers in Genesis clearly doesn't understand that. But what I will give them credit for is that they went and checked the four references that Carmen used. This was made even more clear in how Carmen et al. defined the accuracy of their filtering strategy. The number of FS differences was approximately tenfold higher than the expected number of de novo mutations considering the range of published chromosome Y mutation rates. This finding prompted us to explore additional filters. Of the four studies they cited, only the Shu study represented a pedigree-based Y chromosome mutation rate. The other three studies derived a mutation rate via the historically circular evolutionary geology-based molecular clock method, or by extrapolating the autosomal mutation rate onto the Y chromosome. You guys see what's going on here? The creationist is accusing Carmen of being biased in that he's purposely trying to reduce mutation rates so that it can conform to the results of other papers that support an ancient human evolutionary ancestor, as if that's what Carmen's actual intention is. And then the creationist does the most elementary reading of the cited papers, dismissing them because they use geology-based molecular clock methods. There's no further explanation other than that. And you know, if anything, Carmen would have been more honest by citing mutation rates that were obtained through different methods. It's important to cross-check and calibrate these things with various different procedures to ensure there isn't an error with the procedure itself. It's sort of how science works, especially when we are diving into the mysteries of ancestry. But of course, it doesn't stop there. They also interpreted Carmen's use of filters and concluded that three of the combination filters used to decrease mutations were not required. What is this based on? The fact that other pipelines did not use that filter combination and that Carmen's filtering system was too stringent. They left it at that and just wanted us to believe that Carmen's methodology was flawed. What's so dangerous about this paper is that it applies actual science to a lot of this. A lot of their analyses are indeed accurate, but it's the conclusions they draw that is ridiculous. By using using giant leaps of logic and bad justification. Yet, it still seems convincing because a lot of what they did is still science. If you don't read the paper carefully, it can be easy to fall into their trap. Now, this paper is littered with these examples, but I won't go over them all due to a lack of time. But feel free to read the paper yourself. Anyway, let's address the final argument, the graph that was shown in the video. Why is it that the predicted evolutionary mutation numbers are much higher than the, quote, actual evolutionary root? I absolutely hate how they use these categories in the x-axis because it's not accurate in reflecting the actual data they used. If you just read the description, they derived this from Carmen et al. You know, the data they shamelessly changed from the author's original intent. They even explicitly wrote, For the Carmen study, several filter options were supplied, and we chose filter C because it corresponded to previously published criteria. Oh, fuck off. And then for the other high coverage sequencing paper they referenced, Meredi et al., which the paper hardly mentions or justifies, they listed mutation rates for many many different types of situations such as various paternal ages, and it was always in the ballpark of around 10 to the power of negative 8. So I don't know where the creationist even pulled negative 7 out from when creating this table. Good thing I don't need to check how they did their timeline calculations because their premise is all wrong. Honestly, I'm glad I can save a bit of work because the creationist author doesn't go into a lot of detail on how these calculations are performed. So in conclusion, this paper is garbage. It belongs in the trash, and AIG should be ashamed for publishing this on their website. So yeah, after digging around a bit, it turns out that AIG has a bunch of these papers written in a series they call Answers Research Journal, which by the way received a lot of criticism from legit scientific literature publishers. We'll just leave it at that for now.